Hello, listeners. Been wondering how you can help the show? Probably not. But here are five things you can do. One, subscribe. Support the show by clicking the subscription link in the show notes. Two, review on iTunes, on our website, www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com, or on whatever app you listen to. Three, donate. When you go to our website, click the cute coffee cup icon. Or in the show notes, click the subscription link. Four, share. Sharing really is caring. Tell your friends and even your enemies to check out the show. Five, watch. Wait a minute. It's a podcast, not a movie. Actually, it's both. Check the show notes to find out where to watch the documentary. You can also rent it on Prime Video. That's it. Oh, one last thing. Enjoy this episode. Do you like poker? Good, because tonight we've got a full house, a paranormal full house, at the haunted Linville Manor. Tonight we bring back inspired ghost tracking with the dynamic duel of psychic mediums Rob Guttrow and Troy Klein. Also joining us, and perhaps the most courageous of the bunch, is Wynn Brewer, owner of the Linville Manor. And I welcome back our sometimes co-host, Kyle Carvin. Two names that you may hear during this broadcast that were investigators but aren't on the panel are Josh Yetter Clark and investigator Tom Williams, who is also Rob's husband. So, settle down with your best spooky libation and get ready to meet a bevy of ghosts. In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host ghost this is my podcast based on my paranormal documentary afraid of nothing each episode we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens join me who is this large man and what's he doing in our bedroom as we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie this is afraid of nothing Wow, what a great show we have tonight. We don't have just one, we don't just have two, we have three guests and the return of sometimes co-host Kyle Carbon, who's been doing a lot of stuff since the last time he was on the show. So First up, we're going to welcome back good friend Rob Guttrow, the pet psychic. And Rob is also an investigator for the group Inspired Ghost Tracking. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back, Bob. Cool. And also with Rob is Troy Klein, who was on a prior show where we talked about the double murders. There's another place that we're going to talk about tonight, which is uh, the Linville Manor. So, Troy, welcome. Hey, thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. Cool. And then the owner. How cool is that? The owner of the haunted property is Wynn Brewer. Wynn, welcome to the show for the first time. Hey, thanks. Great to join everybody. Well, appreciate it. And last but not least, or maybe least on this time, it's Kyle Carvin, our wandering actor who's been going across the country. Kyle, welcome back. And is there anything you've you got to report on in your travels across the country? <laughs> well, definitely the least. But uh, no, I'm just excited to be here and talk with everybody. This is exciting. Cool. Let's get right into it because the background on this is... Rob and Troy were brought in to investigate an entity in the basement of the home that appeared three weeks prior, and there are also a ton of other earthbound ghosts in the home and outside as well. The property is called Linville, and the original property belonged to John Smith in the 1600s. The property was subsequently owned by the Bowie families, the original structure that stood on the site in the 1700s. 
was destroyed by a fire in 1815, and that's going to come back later on in this episode. The current structure, built in 1852, stands on the same original foundation. The property has had two other names before, Thorpeland and Glad Acres, and its current owner is a gentleman we're going to talk to right now, Wynn Brewer. So, Wynn, what inspired you to purchase the Linville Manor? Uh, well, first I'll say you've you've done a great job of, of your research there. You had you got you got a long strand of history down pat. So great, great job there. As far as me being here, it was kind of a fluke. I've come to think that perhaps the house may have willed me to be here through the strange circumstances that kind of came about for me to wind up in this estate. Basically, what it all boiled down to is I was looking for a two bedroom home. Yeah, you're like, once you look at pictures, you're going to say, do you know what that looks like? So, yes. (laughs) And I had my red fin settings very low. uh, So you would never think that this estate would pop up. But because it was in this online auction, it was in foreclosure and needed a little work done. So it was trapped in this online auction. And the start point was sort of where my red fin settings were. So I had to kind of do this blind bidding from a group in Texas. And in the end, I I somehow acquired a construction loan because you couldn't get a mortgage on the house. And it just happened within a couple of weeks. They just said, okay, you were the highest bidder and it's yours. So yeah, I went into action of, okay, I've got to get out of my junior bedroom apartment in DC and move out to this mansion in the woods of Maryland and start renovations. And then you know, not long after being here, I kind of found out that I wasn't alone. So did they not tell you about that when you did the auction? Was that something that wasn't brought up or it came out after the fact? You know, looking at the house, you would probably say that is a haunted house. The realtor, she did not disclose any of the history or reportings or any anything that, that might have kind of raised a brow about it being haunted. But she did say when I met her that, She would not be going in the house because she did not do old spooky houses and she was going to sit in her car and drink coffee. So from the get go, I kind of thought, okay, uh, is there something I should know about this house? When did it come to the point where you said, all right, I'm experiencing stuff. I'm not crazy. I need to get somebody in here to check it out. When did that happen? Well, it actually was a building process that kind of took years until Rob and Troy came into the picture. And I say that because essentially I moved in immediately, started doing repairs onto the home. It was completely stripped. They were going to bulldoze this place. And yeah, I know. And all of those history aficionados out there, I know you would see it and your heart would just be like, no, save it. I'm one of those people. So yeah, work began on the house, trying to bring it back up, repair. The doors had been kicked in. There were no light fixtures, no furniture. So it was bare bone minimum and basically glorified camping in July of 2018, I want to say. And so at the beginning, though, a couple weeks in, I started hearing sounds. Uh, Josh, who lived at the house at the time, he was sort of experiencing things as well. We just kind of chalked it up to old house, going to be a lot of creeks. Who knows? There could still be like a bat or something hanging out in one of the walls. But within months, it kind of ramped up and became available on Airbnb. And not long after that, guests started having more and more experiences. And it went from jiggling doorknobs to walking down the hall to full on seeing someone standing at the foot of a bed with no eyes. So it quickly went from zero to a thousand. And it wasn't just, oh, you know, people are kind of getting spooky things. It was time after time of confirmed sightings that were repeating with different people, but it was always sort of overlapping the same situation, same circumstances. We still have things like that on the regular weekly basis with whatever guests come into the house. And just to add a little bit more, I would say that it really didn't become an issue because people were not terrified until I think last year, I believe it was last year. It's been a long year. It's been a long several years for all of us. Oh, yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah, so I was trying to clean out the basement, and a big part of doing that was this giant old boiler system was in the basement, and I've been trying to get it out. It's just ridiculously heavy. But thankfully, I was able to post it online, and someone came to retrieve it for the scrap metal. But when they did, they removed it, and it kind of scraped the foundation. And also just, I don't know if it's because it has something to do with heat and the house had the association of the fire, Uh, something happened. And when that boiler went out, it wasn't just the experiences that people had been having on the typical. There was this new feeling uh, in the air and, and around. It almost felt like you'd walk into a room and it would drain your energy and fatigue you and Just a lot of footsteps then started coming from the basement, upstairs, and there was an old filing cabinet left from the 1950s when a representative from Illinois, Calvin D. Johnson, and his wife lived here. They worked in downtown D.C., and they had brought this incredibly heavy filing cabinet slash safe, put it in the basement. And after that boiler went out, you would randomly go into the basement and the drawer, one of these heavy drawers, would be wide open. So we were kind of back and forth that, okay, maybe you left this open when you were doing laundry or downstairs doing, you know, whatever. But then one day I was downstairs, there's a small gym down there. And as I was lifting weights, I saw a shadow pass across the wall quickly. I thought it was the dog that was in the house. Uh, looked around, dog wasn't there, and then that filing cabinet just opened like quickly. Oh, wow. me. I know. And my, I mean, you can feel it. my skin just is still tingling from that. If you weren't bench pressing when that happened, I guess. Right, no, no, right, no. <laughs> uh, there might have been one extra uh, ghost around here, but at that point, uh, Josh, who I mentioned earlier, he, I believe, was in contact with Troy. And it just came up, the circumstances, the, at this point, years of things that had been going on in the house and the fact that we really needed some expert advice. And Troy and Rob were you know, kind enough to say, hey, we'll take the case and come and check it out for you. And they picked up on quite a lot. Now, before we hand it over for, for Kyle to talk to Rob and Troy, had you ever had any paranormal experiences before this? Were you, did you ever consider yourself somewhat psychic or open to that sort of experience? Over the years now, I've kind of gotten this question. And what I kind of say is my birthday actually falls pretty close to Halloween. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I've always sort of been comfortable in that spooky time of year. And different things have happened through my life's past where I kind of wind up in and around uh, spooky spots. And so it kind of doesn't surprise me that uh, if something was wanting to make contact here, it did. And then I'm kind of the guy that was like, oh, that's fine. Where most people would say, "Uh, if the door's opening on its own, maybe I shouldn't be here. But I just kind of treat it, if anybody's seen the show Ghosts, on um, Paramount Plus. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel that most of the spirits are here. So you just learn to live with them. So I guess you got to be kind of a chill haunted house owner like you if you're going to do it. That seems to be the people that have the most success or are the most comfortable at, at locations have your attitude. I've had a couple people on. I had someone from the Hinsdale house, which is just terrifying as well in New York. And he had a very similar attitude. Yeah, I was just thinking you must have really wanted out of D.C., well, the condition of the house sounding like what it was in, you must have just wanted out of Dodge, huh? You know, DC living, it, for mm-hmm. anyone who's in or around, who's ever experienced it, or most probably most cities, New York, LA, you, you all experience this like people on top of people on top of people. And when you're in your junior bedroom apartment that looks out onto a beautiful courtyard of a dozen other apartments, and then your your rent is the cost of a full mortgage. It makes sense. You know, you get to a place, I actually got a new job over in this area. And so then, in addition to living in my box, I was making a 45 minute commute each way. Uh, Yeah. And so life got to that point where I said, uh, maybe it would be nice to just have a yard, just a little yard. Just, I wasn't wanting much. I didn't want all this, but it's a happy miracle, you know? So 
Yeah, the the city, it's a very special, magical place full of lots of job opportunities. But then you get to a point where you say, maybe there's a little bit more. Yeah. And thus you go into your desperate looking for housing through Redfin and Zillow and whatever else. And usually you wind up in another box that equally has as many problems. But this time through a stroke of magic or maybe ghosts being like, oh, yeah, he he probably will come here and be a steward of the house. Uh, it happened. So here I am. That's cool. I am curious, like how you found Rob and Troy, how you guys all found each other. Josh, who was here, he reached out to Troy and Troy, you may have a little bit more on this, but they basically struck up an instant friendship and then when I came home, because I think I was traveling to Tennessee at the time, I came back and Josh had one of the books that, that you've authored and said, I think we got to talk to this guy, like whatever's going away. And like I said, while I wasn't here, all of that stuff was still going on with the energy in the house and a lot, a lot of, I say, unusual to the unusual things that were not the typical unusual were going on. So at that point, you know, the connection started being made and uh, they volunteered to to come out within weeks. And then Rob and, and Troy, you uh, have dealt or been around these kind of places many times. So when you are contacted and, and told of, you know, some things that are going on in these locations in this particular one, did you have any premonitions before arriving at, uh, at Linville Manor? Well, actually, um, this is Troy, and I, the person that you actually got in touch with to begin with, when was was actually Rob, <laughs> and then uh, you got he was able to make the connection, and he he really felt strongly about this place and this house, and uh, Rob and I have been doing investigations together for quite a few years now, and it's it's really fun to work with someone like Rob because the way my gifting works it seems to play off of other people with different giftings. So if I'm in a group of people that are psychic or people who are intuitive or have gifts of discernment or you name it, it seems to amplify my gifts and I start getting stronger in what I do. And the people around me tend to also get stronger in what they do. It's really an interesting thing. But when Rob and I get together, it, it's often magic. I mean, we will, just like in the double murder investigation we interviewed on the show a while back, that was my very first interview I'd ever, or very first uh, investigation I'd ever gone on with Rob. And he just thought I should try it out. And within just a few hours, uh, we had uncovered that entire issue that was going on in that house. And from then on, it just, it just kept going on and on and on. So Rob contacted me and Rob, I'm just going to, I'm going to say just a few little things about that. You ask Kyle about premonitions. I often before when Rob will call or the, the group we're a part of calls and says, Troy, can you come and check this place out? I start tapping in remotely immediately I, to, if I can. Sometimes it happens immediately. Sometimes it's not until I'm in the car. But usually on, on the way to a location or a few days before, I start getting a type of psychic flash and I start connecting and and I, I start writing these clues down. I'll get pieces. This is like, you know, a jigsaw puzzle, just pieces and clues and parts. I just start picking up and writing down. And I know when it's connected to the place that I'm going. And I will keep that. Actually, this is actually a word of advice to people who do this or, or want to try. You can uh, write your premonitions, your thoughts down. Keep them in a little notebook that's all yours. Nobody else has to see it. And then when you go on the, the trip or the investigation, it's so confirming when things in your book that you wrote down about that place start just like a checklist, just start happening and you find out the names were right, the location was right, there was a Ouija board involved or whatever it is that, that's going on or a Native American connection. So in this case, when Rob called, I, I waited for a few days and I had a, a pretty ominous feeling about the house. I, I didn't know if it was good or bad. It was just a powerful feeling. And then uh, the night, I believe it was the night before we actually went on the investigation. This is unusual for me. I usually don't dream about places, but I had a real vivid dream about Linville Manor. And I had never been there. I hadn't taken looks at pictures. All I have was like an address to show up at you know, the next day. And in this dream, it was, I was in a type of living room, kitchen, kind of high ceilings, very bare 
white walls. And there were about four or five people, I think, in that house. And they and the feeling in it, and I was somehow in the dream, I was part of this family. And they were abusive. They were verbally abusive. They made fun of each other. They put people down. I mean, it was just anxiety like you wouldn't believe in the dream. And I remember the feeling I had in the dream of feeling just horrible. And like, it, it just made me doubt myself. I mean, it was just... A person in that situation, if they've ever been in a family situation where people are just really awful to you, that's what that dream was about. And in the dream, you know, I remember just trying to flee the house and leave the house and listening to the arguments and all of that stuff and finally able to get out. And then I woke up and it, it took me a while to shake that off. It was so powerful. So when we finally got to the house, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, there were several confirmations of just the layout and the house. I, I think the house that I saw was probably the one that burned down, but because they built the house up on the foundation, probably some of it followed the structure lines because right where the kitchen and, and area was and the dining room and everything in that house is exactly was the layout of my dream. It, it just looked very different. Is that about right, Rob? Is that what you remember? Uh, yes, it is. As a matter of fact, I saw like uh, about a six page investigation report where you guys keep keep track of your experiences. So in reading some of that and then hearing about your dream, Troy, you guys had, uh, you experienced headaches when you arrived between that and like this ominous dream you had. Does that ever scream out to you when you go to these places and have these feelings that like maybe we shouldn't be here or is it, no, we're here, we're going through with this at all costs? <laughs> that happens quite often. People react to being contacted paranormally in different ways. Uh, some people just get chills. Some people just have a feeling that they just don't go or they have these premonitions that it's dangerous or it's okay. For me, prior to going, it's rare that I have a dream. This was an exception to that. I usually get flashes that I write down and all of that. And then when I get to the location, once we do connect to a ghost and Rob and I start doing our work, it's very common for both of us to get like headaches on the same side of the head, or we'll feel heat on one part of our body, or we'll feel uh, like a stabbing pain just shoot through our bodies. Uh, one of the cases we were on, we both felt different things. And, and I, you know, I just felt uh, hopelessness. And then I, I felt like a stabbing kind of wound. And Rob felt something entirely different. It turns out it was two different people who were killed in the same house. And I was connecting to one, and Rob was connecting to the other. So Rob, often when we're together, we will, if it starts getting too bad, we, we stop what we're doing and actually open up a circle of light and we start, we'll sage each other if we have to, but we'll pray or meditate with each other and just kind of shake off what's happening. And the headaches often will subside almost instantly for me and then we keep going. But sometimes it does, it, it gets really intense. And when it does, it's part of our job to keep an eye on each other. If we see one of us struggling, we really do stop what we're doing and we go to the rescue and we help that person come out of it and, and make the thing, shake it off. And if it's something that is intentional at telling you how the person died, of course, we take note of that. And we'll even ask the ghost to back off so that we can get the message and understand what's going on without constant pain. <laughs> and that, that's my experience. Just to interject quickly, Rob, your headache didn't go away, right? You, you know, Troy's went away, but yours continued while you looked around the grounds. Can you kind of talk about that and what you thought it might be and guide us around the, the, the grounds as you, as you, what you picked up? Because there's a lot of stuff you guys picked up outside the grounds before you even went inside. Uh, sure. So, y yeah, my, my headache was pretty much constant because there's so many dead people walking around <laughs> outside and inside. And I feel that. I get that headache every time I'm in the presence of one. So when Troy and I were in the front yard, he honed in on uh, what was happening inside. And when I was standing next to him, I, I sensed the ghost of a woman walking by uh, by Troy. And she just conveyed the, the impression that she, she worked on in a farming kind of capacity and she died on the property. But she didn't give me a name. She just kind of walked on by. But Troy, you sensed a little girl playing upstairs, right? Yeah, it did. It was, there's a huge tree. If you're facing the house, there's a giant tree. There's a grandfather tree just to the left of the house in the front yard. Just past that tree on the second floor of the house, I looked up and I could sense a little girl that was dressed. I mean, she looked like she was 
dressed in like a short kind of poofy dress, almost like dressed up like a doll. And she couldn't have been any more than five or six years old. And she was just skipping by the windows, just as happy as she could be. And I was trying to connect to her and figure out, you know, why I was seeing her and like why I was sensing her and how that was connected to the house in any way. But often uh, you'll just see these ghosts go by and there's no real explanation. Sometimes I think uh, they figure out that you can see them at some point if you stay around long enough and eventually they do start connecting with you. And it turned out, I believe, when that that was on the uh, side of the house where there was a nursery at one point, and that is where the children would. Yeah, that's that's correct. And I, I just kind of wanted to jump in because e- even when you say these things, there are still. I like to tell people this is such an active narrative because I'm not only continuing to discover more things and guests are having more experiences, but you know all the pieces are are slowly coming together. There was a a history tour about a month ago, and someone snapped a shot on that side of the house. And you mentioned this little girl, but I don't think until now you you really described what her dress looked like. And the person on the history tour shared this photo with me and said, hey, you know, I don't know if you're, you're looking for your ghost, but I think I captured one in your window. And sure enough, you really have this clear image of a very young girl. And the dress, like you said, it's almost like uh, it looks like a doll's dress. It's so poofy and sort of out of time, you know. Uh, And then last weekend, there were guests here and they were in that same area of the house. And they said that thus far in their investigation, the most things that they'd picked up on were it sounded sort of like giggles in passing, you know, as like a child was playing tricks on them and running around. So, yeah, interesting. That's incredible. And Robin Troy, when you show up, so you're having all these feelings outside. You haven't even stepped inside yet, but you have um, like part of your practice is you ground yourselves to the property or is it to like the earth or like what, what's that process like and, and what does that achieve? Oh, yeah. Um, often uh, I found out through various traditions and cultures throughout the world that people ground themselves uh, to bring balance in a sense a spiritual balance. And the Japanese have one, and they basically the interpretation of it is called forest bathing. And I do that now. And you can basically find a forest that's uh, anywhere around. And when you walk into that forest for about the first 15 minutes, you feel a cleansing. You, it's almost like you feel the trees just sweeping through you, and it, it's it's changing and rebalancing your very energy and, and connecting you right back to where we came from, which was the earth. So we do that, and. When we held on to the tree for just a few minutes, and uh, sometimes you can pray, sometimes you can do sage, you can meditate. There are a lot of different things. Some people hold crystals. It, whatever works for you, but trees really work for me. It was at that point that I stepped away from the tree, and I had been focusing on that little girl when you were just talking about. But at that moment, I felt like I was looking through the eyes of some other person, like an older man. And I didn't know who he was, but what he showed me was where there were trees on the property now used to be open field. And I I was seeing it through his eyes as he saw it back when he was there. And then I looked way over to the far left of the house down over a hill. He let me know and I could see and tell that there were quite a number of horses down there and stables and barns and things like that. Uh, I guess for horses that must have been there to work the land at one point. And so I kind of wrote that down, held on to it, and then shared that with Wynn later. And it turns out that is exactly where all of that was. It's all covered up by trees. You can't see any of that now. But it was it was really confirming uh, when that happened to be able to know that we Rob and I were both on the right path. Yeah, and just to throw in something, you know, while Troy is having these nice visual experiences, poor Rob mm-hmm. Guttrow, his head is literally on fire. So, Rob, you want to talk about what that meant and kind of that prelude of what was going to happen? Yeah, I always seem to be the fall guy for some reason with the with dead people. But um, <laughs> yeah, as Troy was experiencing, horse, experiencing the uh, horses and a dog, which we'll get to, I had the sensation that my head suddenly caught on fire. And I actually touched the top of my head, and it was actually hot to the touch. Suddenly I realized that it was the ghost of a woman that was still present in the backyard. And, and she told me that she was the victim of of a burning home from the 1800s. And it turned out the house burned down in 1850. So obviously she was one of the residents there. She told me she ran out of the house with her head on fire 
and she had long brown hair. She succumbed to her burns, and she actually died in the yard. And I believe that she was running toward the, a pond or a body of water that was back that way. Troy, you actually picked up a message with – or a dog, and you had a message – for the owner of that dog, if you want to tell you a little bit about that story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was touching. I, I mean, Rob had just, and Tom had walked around to the backyard while Rob was having the burning head experience, the burning man experience back there. <laughs> I was still walking around all my senses out and feeling, and there was a tree just down over the hill in the backyard, just, just maybe, I don't know, 20 yards or something. I don't remember what kind of tree it was, but it was beautiful and spread out on the top and uh, just a nice tree. And I always, as I said, I always connect to trees. This is a really cool technique. I've learned to ask trees sometimes or connect to them and just say, you, you've been here during probably the lifetime of this house. Uh, you've absorbed a lot of the memories. You've seen a lot. You're connected to this place. You've been, you were here when this happened. Can you share any of that energy with me? You know, I just had to connect to that object energy and the spiritual energy of what's going on with the trees and uh, sometimes you can do that with rocks or any and other objects, but trees are good to to do that with. And just in that moment, I saw a dog, a little, it looked like a golden lab or something, just a female dog. And she was so happy and just as sweet as she could be. And she came up from around that tree and I was just like, you're just kind of blown away. Because again, Rob always sees the animals and the dogs, but he was so busy or at that moment that the dog, I guess, took the opportunity to connect with me. And so I was like, okay, that's really cool. And I, I thought about like, what's her name and all of that. And I just got this feeling that her name was something like lady and she died and she'd been buried somewhere near that tree, which was why she was still there. And then as, as it went on, it turned out that she wanted me to let the, her dad, her owner know that she wasn't angry that she was okay, that she, she was all right, and that she didn't blame him, wasn't upset. And she wanted me to convey that message to when and to the people so that that message could be conveyed because she was absolutely fine and okay on the other side and very happy and, and intact. Later on, <laughs> I was telling Wynn about this, it just blew me away. It turns out there was a dog that the owner who was in his 90s was still alive or still alive. He had a dog a long time ago, and they think her name was Lady, and, and she was a golden, little golden lab type of dog. She was outside one night, and they had problems in the area with wolves. And the owner went outside with a gun. There were wolves out there. They heard them howling and things like that. And he saw like what looked like a wolf run through the yard. Turns out it was his dog, Lady, and he shot her and killed her by accident. And he carried the guilt with him for what happened. He loved that dog and the dog loved him. And so when Lady found the opportunity to communicate with us, she just had a message for her dad. She's just like, hey, let him know I'm okay. I don't blame him. It was an accident. It's okay. And pets have unconditional love and they just, they don't hold it against you. And if you carry pain in you because of the accident of a, of a loved animal that died and you felt responsible in some way, or you had to help the animal pass on like through a veterinarian or something, just know our experiences with these pets are this. They do not carry blame. They know if you love them or not, and they know your intention. And that dog knew that that was completely an accident. And he was actually out there trying to protect the family. So when all this activity is happening outside before they even get into the house, which must have blown your mind, I think the next thing was you took them into the house and you took them into the front parlor. What was your mindset then? And what did you talk to these guys about? Yeah, so I think what's what's crazy to say is, yeah, we, we didn't even have any interaction. As soon as they got there, they went to work. And I literally remember looking out the window and I was like, okay, you know, it's another loopy day at Linville. Like, what's going on? These guys are pros. They know exactly what they're doing and they pick up on so much. In fact, they went to the the tree. If you were going to draw energy from a tree, it would be the tree they picked. It's the second oldest beech tree in the entire state. A lot of people have had theories because so much activity happens on the newest wing of the house, which was installed in the 1950s, but it was built on top of the roots of that tree. And so I don't know if some of the spirits draw from that or what, but 
they walked exactly to that point of energy and then just around to, as Troy was talking about, the other tree, which is the old black walnut tree. And just a quick note, even more about the dog, I circled back with Ben, who's actually was born in the house, is 90 years old now, and asked him about this story and told him, you know, what, what they had picked up about ladies saying, it's okay. Don't worry about it. And essentially he said, you know, not only was the dog shot, the reason it was a tragedy is they had taken the dog to several farms away because of these wolves. And they were trying to basically watch for them. But lady in the night had come home. And so that was the greatest, the sadness, because here's this dog who just cannot stay away from her family. And so she comes back to the farm and then it's, family tragedy. So I can see why the loyal friend that was Lady had this message and was just like, listen, let the family know. I love them and we're good. So yeah, when they came in, it was crazy because very slight introductions, just let's get down to business because they had already picked up on so much. And even once they walked in, I could just see this really, you could just tell that that they were being affected. And, you know, you guys can, can talk on your own about it, but I knew that left and right, there were individuals in the house trying to convey messages or show them glimpses of their lives. And I guess I just was really pretty quiet at that point because they were the ones telling me everything that was going on and it was automatically matching up to what I'd experienced, what guests had experienced. Will I say I was surprised? No. But was I amazed at at the similarities and what they were saying? Absolutely. Yeah, I think the big thing the audience wants to know is, did Rob ask for Excedrin or a leave when he went into the house? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, not only were they on fire, but then later on, they'll tell you about the reports of, I think you mentioned that you felt like a bag of concrete was on your head. So it's just, You know, I I typically am a pretty good host and and offer people something to drink or, you know, a nice seat, but they they got welcomed with a different effect, I'd say. That's why Troy likes hanging out with Rob, because Rob gets all the the battery and Troy gets... (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. He draws away from me. (laughs) So Rob and Troy have been outside. You've been warming up to the point of your head is on fire. So you step inside. And stuff picks up pretty quickly um, as soon as you get into the main stairwell. And uh, if you're going to like walk us through some of that and, and some of the investigation where you start encountering spirits with names such as the touching man and Chase's grandmother, the groundsman, kind of walk us through some of those. Sure, I can just jump right in. Um, as soon as we walked in the parlor, there, it was it was apparent to me and to Troy that there were a number of ghosts that were standing there watching us. And I think I counted up to f- five or, or six. I, That's right. I can't remember. But at one point, one of them, the, the guy that I called the touching man, put all five fingers on my left shoulder and I could actually feel it. And I, I, I remember turning around and looked and there was actually nobody physically there. So that was <laughs> a little surprising. That man, it was a man, continued to uh, affect me during the investigation. And he also shared with me a dry throat. I felt like he was a smoker. He was a heavy smoker. And then he also gave me the taste of blood in my mouth. And Troy was, Troy, you were, you were feeling good actually while I was dealing with all that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I I actually appreciate that part of it. I'd like for it to stay that way. (laughs) It's not always the case, but yeah. Now you felt a little girl, right? Yeah, I think it was the same little girl. She was just curious, and she just stood like a little girl would, just a little bit over to the side of another person and just kind of watched, but just really curious. And it it was interesting to me that there were about five different ghosts there that they weren't threatened in any way, and they seemed to be very curious about why we were there and the fact that we could sense them. Now, some of these spirits that you encountered that night, I'm always interested in... You know, I've heard many different theories and explanations for why some spirits remain and why some want to move on or but they may need help. But that's something that you you both help with. So when you help spirits pass, which which you did this particular investigation, is that something that 
they willingly wanted to do, or is this something that you kind of encourage them because they don't want to do? Talk about a little bit of that. It is different in every single case. Sometimes ghosts are just people, and sometimes they're afraid to cross over because of religious upbringing. They're afraid they'll go to hell, or they did some terrible things and they think they're going to be punished for it, or they feel guilty about it. And then in other cases, we've had ghosts who have remained just because they really love the place and they love the grounds and uh, they, they weren't quite ready to leave. And you'll often hear stories about people when they pass in a family and it was a mom or a dad or a brother or sister who loved their family. And everyone, a lot of people in the family will say they sensed or felt or saw their loved one when they passed away for just a brief moment. And sometimes uh, those loved ones will stay around and just keep an eye on you to make sure you're okay or to help you out and, and to be around to give you a sense of comfort. In this case, in, in just about every case, you have to have a conversation, you know, spiritually, and you can verbally speak out to these ghosts. And you start getting a sense of if they're afraid or if they're ready to go or whatever it is. And if they're afraid to move on or there's a reason they're staying, you can talk with them and, and encourage them and gain their trust. And you let them know, you know, we're not here to banish you to hell and we're not here to some People in the ghost shows that we watch from time to time, you'll see people that go in and try to provoke ghosts, yeah. which is just stupid. They'll go in and yell at them or cuss at them or say things just to see if they can get a reaction out of them. That's the worst thing you can do. And our group never does that. I mean, if anybody did that in our group, we would ask them to leave because it's just, it's disrespectful. You would never go into someone's house and do that to a living person. Why on earth would you do that to a dead person? <laughs> So uh, in this case, yeah, uh, we, we met a couple ghosts along the way, and eventually upstairs there was a woman who was absolutely, she was, through a period of time, she was ready to go, and it was a beautiful crossing. And Rob, you had a story. There's a Benny Goodman tune involved in here somewhere. You want to talk about that? Uh, that, that was actually Troy that actually picked up on the music while we were down, I believe we were downstairs, Troy, in the, uh, the TV room. That's right. Well, explain that, Rob, because I was in a different part of the house. I was dealing with the groundskeeper. And then you called me to come in because you and someone else were experiencing something in the in the drawing room or in the reading room. And then I came in and that's when all of the rest of it happened. Why don't you set that okay. story uh, up? Yeah, we were in the TV room and that's where this with this woman, this female ghost named Gladys, who was a former resident of the house, used to sit and watch television, apparently. She didn't seem like the nicest person, but I was standing there with Josh, and we both felt like our heads were underwater in that room. In one spot, especially in front of the television, it seemed like to me that all sound was being muffled. Um, it felt like I was wearing earplugs when people were talking to me. <laughs> so I, I attribute that to her energy in there. And then that's when you came in, and there was actually a bag of gravel on your head. And that's when the music came right. into your, your mind. It did. I, and it felt honestly like somebody took a bag of heavy gravel and it went right over the entire crown of my head. And so I could feel the just different throbbing bumps and what felt like gravel and just heaviness in my brain. And uh, the same feeling, muffled sounds and all of it you were getting, Rob, and we were just connecting to it. And it happened when I was standing in a certain area of the room. And so as we were still connecting and there was some talking going on, a Benny, I guess Benny Goodman song that I do you remember the name of the Rob, the song when or Rob, what the name actually is of that song. Is it Moonlight Serenade? That's what it is. And it just da 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 that song. And it, it was playing and it wouldn't stop. And it was playing in my head. It was it, it almost just became unbearable because it was really loud. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get that song out of my head. So as I was trying to connect for the rest of that evening until she finally crossed, it was a desperate attempt for me to not only try to sing that song, but talk to Wynn and others and try to describe a song that I didn't know the name of and, and who it was. And I just knew it was like from like one of those big band airs. And uh, it kept playing and playing and playing. So I was 
rifling through my phone and Wynn was helping out and we were just for the next what 15 20 minutes looking for that song yeah I, I was gonna say you know I just threw that out there real quick but that's just because we spent almost 40 minutes researching that song with, with Troy humming and <laughs> Google and YouTube and so now forever I will know that song <laughs> I thought there was an app out where you could like hum a couple bars of a song and it would kind of yeah bring I up think suggestions. There is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is there? Oh, God, that would have saved us some time, I'll tell you. But I'll never forget the feeling when we finally got the right song. By that point, it had all moved upstairs to the main bedroom, the master bedroom, where a lot more started happening. And uh, we were still looking for that song. So, Rob, I want you to describe the rest of that, and then I'll, I'll describe what happened when the, finally we found the song and started playing the music. Sure. As soon as we walked into that room upstairs... My my headache came back, so I knew that Gladys was standing there in the room with us. And she conveyed a couple of things about her relationship, like with her husband, whose name was Charles. And to me, it sensed, I f- it felt like a, a love-hate relationship and that they stayed together because of children and money. And that's that's the way that she conveyed it. She also mentioned to me that she really liked Josh, who was there, because he seemed to be like a caretaker, someone concerned with the well-being of others. She also said that she was ready to cross, but she said when she's gone from her earthly prison, another ghost in the house would likely take her place using the bed because she made herself known by, I guess, by wrinkling the, the bed covers or, and playing with the bed covers. Yeah, I, I'll jump in real quick and just say that, see, these are instances of things that had gone unnoticed until the pandemic. And then because I was home so much, I would go into the room and all the rooms were set ready for guests, but nobody was booking because, you know, nobody was traveling or anything. And I'd go in there and notice that one side of the bed, it constantly looked like somebody had laid in the bed, sat on the bed, make up the bed. Hours later, it would be messed up. And so that was sort of the identifier that someone was using this room. That's when Troy managed to find the song, and then we realized we had to, to help her cross over. As, as we got more of the story, I, we could sense her in the room, and there was another man we couldn't quite identify yet who I, I felt in the room, like a younger, kind of a younger man. So at one point, I started also connecting to her, and then I told her, I said, I think we found the song that you've been telling me. And I told her, I said, uh, you know, Gladys, I really, it's an honor to be here, and we're really here to help you. And we could use your help because we want to help you cross over and we want to do it respectfully. And we're just talking to her about this. And so she conveyed, as Rob said, that she was ready to go and when turned the song on. And oh, my God, it was like this emotion just filled the whole room. It it literally made her eyes well up. I was I was all teary eyed and I could just feel the intensity of it. And finally hearing that song physically that she'd been playing over and over in my head. It turns out it was one of her favorite songs. And when that music happened, she was no longer in that kind of frail uh, shape. She appeared to me at that point looking really nice. And she dressed up. She was was wearing like the shimmery kind of a black like gown you'd wear to a party that had like sparkly things on it that, that dangled. And she had a hat on. Her hair was fixed up. I mean, she looked great. Sometimes ghosts will do that. They actually will, uh, when they're ready to go, their loved ones and different angels or beings will show up. And it's this ceremonial thing that happens. They just appear and it's an honor and they're waiting for those that person to cross over finally. So you can imagine it's almost like a bon voyage and a welcome home at the same time. You would throw a party for that. And often these people do. And so she showed up and she just sat gently on the uh, end of the bed as we talked to her and as the music played. And uh, she basically said, before I go, I want to apologize. I want you to share how sorry I am for some of the, the things that I said and I did and the anger that I had. She goes, you know, I had, there was an issue with my brain, which I think when was, she had brain cancer? Is that what was going on? Yeah, I believe she actually passed away from brain cancer in that room. And it affected her personality and she was in pain. It was, you can imagine if it's muffled hearing, sight, and you feel like you have a bag of gravel on your head all at the same time, all the time, that would make you cranky. And it made her even harder to get along with. 
she didn't trust people. Like she always, she apologized for questioning people's intentions. She just wanted, she just wanted to say, I'm really sorry for the people that I said one thing and did another. And, or I gave them permission and then took it away or the bad things that I said to them, I'm really sorry. But part of it was, that was my mode of survival. I had to be a strong woman in those days. Uh, I was here in the house and I needed people to pay attention to me and listen to me and unless you were strong. She said, unless you did that, you weren't taken seriously. And she goes, so I did that, it became part of me and the brain cancer made it even worse. And she goes, that's not who I am. And I am so sorry. And then with that, we all gathered together in a, a circle and we just gently opened a portal, which is we focused on the center of the circle and between us, we go through a guided meditation where you open up what looks like a uh, sometimes a beam of light or a pool of water that's full of light in between you. And this time it was kind of like an exploding light, just a small star. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it just, you can feel it uh, warming up your legs and your arms when these things open. It's just everybody in the room, um, I'll get physical sensations when it's going on. It's kind of fun to listen to people's reactions. And uh, so we opened up uh, quite a nice portal and there was a young man. He kind of had sandy blonde hair that walked through and greeted her the music was playing i think they danced a little bit and then she just said goodbye and she gently walked with him and 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 left and then we closed the portal and the room went silent and the entire energy of the room went. was it rob and you was win there too or was it just rob and you at that point i know it was rob and win and me and josh and was there anybody else in there at that point tom was there when yeah, for the audience, uh, Tom is Rob's husband, who we want to get on the show, Rob, but he, he, we'll, we'll get him on sometime because he'll share his experience. Oh, he's well, sure. Tom's great. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's the guy I want to meet. He's such a cool guy. Seems. So, so when did you see this too? Or, or was it only like Rob and Troy that saw kind of the portal? Or did you just sense things when, when this was happening? Right. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot of sensory overload because I did not know coming into this, that I would be a part of leading a ghost through, which was, I mean, a very unique experience to say, if you haven't done it, do it. Kid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I didn't see what they said. I don't have their sight, but I definitely, you could feel the sense in the room, the beginning of the heaviness that I believe that the spirit was carrying and then as sort of moving moving her through or she was getting ready, it started to lift and lighten. And then at the end, there was just this overwhelming sense of peace and acknowledgement and intention. And just it was so settled because normally you would walk in that room and you never really know how you would feel on any given day when you'd walk in there. But it just felt like we're good. Check. Like it's it's all settled. So Again, I go back to saying these guys are the pros. I would never have said that I would believe somebody could walk in and, and change the atmosphere, but they were able to do it. Um, well, I, I, I got to give kudos to you because if I owned the house, I'd say, no, no, these go stay right here. <laughs> I'm renting out these rooms, you know, but uh, you let them go, which I well, give you a lot of credit for. Well, here's some cool stuff. I mean, these guys have, have taught me and enlightened me on a lot of things. And I believe we had a conversation recently where Rob and Troy, you told me that, you know, just because a ghost crosses over doesn't mean that they're gone, gone. If they, oh, right. if yeah. they choose, they can come back, they can visit. So um, it is almost like a selfish thing to say, you know, you have to stay here and, and take on the lore of the house. I think that the ones that, that remain, they, they, are really happy, but then some of them, they had their time, whether it was from 1950 to 1960, and they're kind of done, but they were just stuck in the feelings and the emotion. And the message that's so crazy in, in that she said, hey, I'm leaving, but someone is going to be taking this bed. So truth be told, weeks later, I go in there and I notice that the bed is messed up again. However, it is not messed up in the way that it used to be. It used to be either like someone sat on it or like a fetal position. And now it's just like somebody had an uncomfortable night's sleep. So I truly believe that someone literally was waiting for the room to be like, all right, my time, I'll be sleeping in there next. Because it's yeah. a different it's a different something in there now. It's crazy. They're all like calling shotgun <laughs> as soon as she's out. Like, yeah. bedroom's mine. <laughs> I, I know the listeners are like, oh, what a happy ending to this episode. But 
There's a twist. There's another story in the basement. Yes. So you guys come to find out that there's something going on in the basement. And it has a pretty interesting backstory. And I'm not sure how to say the name. So you'll have to, to let us know how to say the name and, and everything that happened down in the basement. First of all, we had sensed at least five ghosts in the in the foyer of the house. And then we didn't talk about the groundsman that was in the left-hand side of the house. We were very busy dealing with Gladys. And then we went into the kitchen and they, there was uh, an entity there. And then they took us into the basement and because that was the uh, that was the dark kind of unnerving thing. And sorry to interrupt. When was that? Was that the primary reason for the call? Was the experience you had in the basement? Yeah, exactly. People had experienced things in some of the bedrooms, but again, it wasn't until that radiator came out that things took a turn and that atmospheric feeling. So yeah, the positive walkout with Gladys was actually a bonus. And then we were kind of getting down to the true business. Mm -hmm. So so the basement thing was, um, we were told it was something like an uh, an amorphous figure, a a shapeless figure in the basement that caused anxiety down there and not a good feeling. And that's that's why we were called in. They didn't know if it was uh, human or inhuman. But when we get down there, I actually sensed a male ghost. And Troy, I think you had the the same impression, right? Yeah, exactly. So this ghost started conveying what had happened, and and his name was Aloysius. I actually had to write it down. He was spelling it to me, and I wrote it down in the journal that I carry. And when I looked up the name when I got home, according to a user from South Africa, the name means gift of God. So he he gave me a story, and sometimes a ghost will give a story to share what happened to them and why they're there. So his story was pretty complex. He said he was originally from Africa, brought to America as a slave, wound up working for the owners of the original house in the 1700s. The original house has like a house servant, and he had two jobs. Troy was able to identify actually both those jobs. The one that that I that sticks out in my head was he was he had the job of being able to they trusted him to come into the house and he there was an entrance to the back and he would go into the basement and that's where they kept their oil lamps for the house and they kept the house lit that way and his job was to keep them all topped off and in good shape and he loved it I mean he they he he really liked the family and and he thought that was a pretty nice job uh, for him to do. What was the other job? I don't remember what it was. I was now. tending the horses that you sensed down at the end of That's the property. <laughs> so so the rest of the story that he shared with Troy and I was that the original house burned down. We learned the original house burned down from a massive fire. And apparently that, well, obviously that killed some of the people that are now resident ghosts, like the woman whose hair was on fire that I enjoyed in the backyard. Troy, I remember that he shared that the fire had been caused by an oil lamp that tipped over. Yeah, and that's what was so sad. And it happened upstairs. Uh, and I got the impression of where we met the grandmotherly lady that was grandmother of one of the people there at the house. Somewhere in that area, one of the oil lamps or something it spilled over and it was at night and it caught the curtains fire and he showed me i mean i could see just the flames just quickly spread but he didn't cause the fire though no he didn't it happened it was just one of the lamps and what was interesting is the reason he was had so much rage and so much anger is he was pinned with causing that fire because he was the keeper of the lamps and they blamed him for it and needed a scapegoat and they didn't know who did it and they just assumed he did it and i think they saw him uh, I could see him like, like in an urgency, either leaving the basement or whatever, figuring out what was going on. And and someone must have seen him because they blamed him for it. And what was really interesting was, is Rob and I, for a little while, we, we go back and forth with this and we're picking up on the story and it's unfolding. We're getting bits and pieces at different times. We both were, were seeing him, but with those vacant, dark, just vacant dark eyes in this decayed state and just wet and, and muddy and just a sloppy mess. And we couldn't figure out what the connection was until, <laughs> until he shared with us what that was. And he basically was hunted down and the people of the area 
thought it was him and they went after him. He knew they were going to blame him. And so he fled and they chased him and they end up killing him he, and drowning him in a river and in this muddy abyss, this mess. And that was his last memories. And the thing that made him so angry was he also shared, not only was it mistaken identity, but he had, he had his own young budding family. There was a young woman he showed me that was just about his age, a little younger and a couple little kids. And they, they relied on him and they lived in a little home, a little hut, a little house on the grounds. And he never came home and he never was able to share the story. And from then on, everyone blamed him for this. And so he, he was angry that his family was taken from him. He was angry that he was blamed for something he didn't do. He was blamed for the way he, he's angered for the way he died. And what was really interesting about this is uh, when said that often in one of the rooms in the upstairs, this uh, figure will appear at the end of the bed when there are women staying in that room and he's just staring at them with vacant eyes and it scares them half to death. And he just doesn't do anything, but he's just there. And so Rob and I were talking about that and it turned out that that room where the, where women say they see this figure was directly, I mean, you could draw, you could make a column. It went directly from where we were in the basement, straight up to that room in the house, almost like a portal. And, uh, we could see him in that room at one point. I walked in there and I just stopped at the end of the bed and, and one's like, oh my God, that's the spot, you know, <laughs> where this man stands. And I could see him not only looking at the bed, but also looking out of the window. And I couldn't figure it all out. And somehow it was all connected. So basically he lost his family. He lost this woman that he loved very much. They were supposed to, I don't know if they were married yet, but they were close to it. It was that kind of thing. From then on, I guess the connection was, is that women in the house, like he would just this vacant stare of longing. Yeah. I, I also sense that he was 23 years old and he also said something about two small children. So I assume that he was actually married to that woman. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just know that he had the two kids. At one point we wondered if we, I assumed the same thing, but we wondered if maybe, it, maybe she was his sister and those were his two siblings yeah. or they were married and it was two kids. He but really didn't want to say anything. Whichever it was, <laughs> they loved each other very much. You also said his name was like from South Africa. You found the meaning, a South African name. So it seems like he could be from there, right? Yeah. He said his name was Aloysius, which is a South African, that for gift of God. The other thing too about about him was after we learned his story and his quest for revenge, and that's why he hung around, really. He wanted revenge on the men that murdered him. We tried to tell them those men are long dead. I mean, they're dead by over 150 years or 200 years, but we couldn't convince him to cross over. You know, as, as I've said before, people have their own personalities. If they're stubborn, they're not going to listen to you no matter how many times you tell them that they can cross over and, and rejoin their family or whatever. They're just not going to do it. So we realized we couldn't convince him to cross over. So we had to kind of relegate him to one side of the basement. <laughs> to reduce the negative energy so that Wynn and Josh could use their weights over there in the corner. But the reason he showed up, and this is the really important part that we, we figured out, is that once, as Wynn said, once that boiler was removed, that affected the original foundation of the house that burned down. And that was enough to disturb him so and make him come forward where he hadn't been active before that. And then as a follow-up, so since you've been there for Wynn, has there been any further experiences with him at all, or is he pretty mild-mannered? Yeah. I mean, I think these guys are dead on that essentially he had appeared a few times leading up, which was reason for concern. The, the, the scariest stories that were coming from guests staying here was, was that women would wake up and see a man who they claimed had no eyes standing at the foot of their bed. And then hearing this story, it's just the light bulb went off that, oh, you know, he has eyes. It's just he was wrongfully accused, beaten, and thrown into the river. So he was appearing in this beaten state. So these hollowed eyes were really just bruised eyes. Also, people reported feeling this pressure on their chest, which I imagine would be similar to drowning if he was thrown in the river. Since they came, uh, no. I think there's been a couple of times that he may have appeared in that bedroom again. 
But again, this shift that's happened. And so one, I believe your work, you came in and you sort of talked him down and said, hey, like, we're recognizing you, you're here and you don't want to leave and that's okay. And they gave him a space. So I think one, that respect and us having conversations, because now not not only do I go down there to occasionally lift weights, I, I really go down there all the time to do laundry. That has to happen. So going down there, I, I always kind of have a conversation, just chat with him, tell the guests, any guests that come to the house, the same thing, if they want to go down there, that we acknowledge him. And so I think that that animosity that had sort of built from the radiator going out has settled. And now we're kind of at this easy place, this middle ground of acknowledging why he's here. And also, if guests do have traumatic experiences, in fact, one of the buoy direct descendants, the owners of the house, she came, slept in that bedroom, had an experience, which I know you guys will be interested. We'll have to do some follow up from that visit. But she actually had an encounter with him, but it was they knew going in kind of what to expect. And she actually said that he sat down on the side of her bed and said, free me, release me. And she said, you're free to go. And at that point, he followed her into to dream, showing her past family events and gatherings. And it, but it was very civil. So I think that's what happens now is there's not the animosity. And if guests come and have any experience, they're sympathetic to, to this, this soul. You know, what's interesting about hearing that part of the story when that we just heard is I was thinking, and the feeling was then he wasn't ready to go. He was still angry and he needed more time and we didn't have to push it. So I, I think he's going through a healing process right now and he's giving a lot of thought to it. He's experiencing other people. That makes me feel very good because that means there will come a time where he's ready to cross over. And I think it'll be a beautiful crossing when he does. And like you said, you guys kind of surmise that he was appearing to those who actually reminded him of his family. So even that, you know, letting guests know that this is not something to be afraid of and that if you feel anything from it, that's just you're picking up on something that he went through, but not to be afraid and to have a conversation or communicate with this spirit to make him feel incorporated and cared about. Yeah, this would be a Sam Raimi movie, except for that happy ending you guys just had right there. So it's interesting, you know. To, <laughs> Kyle, you'd get a chance to play some part in this. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know we went longer. This has been excellent. What I do want to end is Rob and Troy, you know, give us a little plug about inspired ghost tracking. And then when you tell us, you know, if someone wants to actually experience this for themselves, what's your website? How can they uh, book a room at, at your uh, at the Linville Manor? So let's start start with Rob and Troy first. Okay. Well, Inspired Ghost Tracking has been around almost 15 years, founded by Margaret Ehrlich, who was on that podcast of the double murder ghost investigation that Troy and I did with her. We welcome all paranormal curious seekers. They have meetings every uh, every Friday. It's in Maryland. It's near the BWI airport. We also teach people all about the paranormal. So, Yeah, that's right. And I, I, the plug I would give to a group like this is if you're going to look for a paranormal group to be part of and to do investigations and maybe try out and practice your gifts and grow in them, find a group that's supportive and is sincere about it. Because if you get into a group that all they want to do is just have a really good ghost story and scare each other, stay away from that group because you can end up getting into a dangerous situation. Often people go untrained into these places and they end up with an attachment or a ghost will follow them home and then they don't know why they're sick or things are going wrong. And it can be a really ugly situation. But this group, uh, not only do they teach you about what's happening, but they do it really with the utmost respect. And as I said before, they are very respectful of people who've passed on and we don't treat them any differently than we would somebody that was still living. Yeah. And speaking of ghosts following you home, when you, you live with a house full of ghosts, how can people visit Lidville Manor and check out what they've heard about on tonight's episode? Yeah, so you can find us. We're on Airbnb. Usually, if you look up Upper Marlboro, Airbnb, Historic Maryland Mansion or Haunted Mansion of Maryland, that will pop it up in the Google. We also have LidvilleManor.com. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook. So all over. If you put in those keywords, you will find a way to make a communication with me from the other side. And then I invite you all, you know, we can do anything from retreats to murder mystery parties. 
to intimate ghost investigations or, you know, just come and have a baby shower because uh, we do that as well. So yeah, just come and, and be a part of it. It's kind of a, a, a community here and always happy to, to have guests and uh, entertain you guys. So Kyle, we, we got to do that. We can have you stay in the basement. I'll stay, you know, maybe in a unhaunted yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say is like I'm I'm traveling through that area in in uh, about the middle of September. So it's a definite stop, but I have to ask if I'm going on Airbnb and I want to like is there a particular room to try to ask for or how does that work? Yeah, so usually we do a booking for the entire house so that people, you know, are not on top of strangers and one one bad egg ruins the entire thing. So Typically, if you book the house, it's kind of yours. Or if you're passing through, like we can work out a way. And then I tend to tell people there's sort of a range of paranormal. So one through four of least haunted to most haunted. Every room that we have for rent has some experiences. So purple room is the mild. And then the overlook and the study are sort of the mid range. And then if you're really brave and you want to see Aloysius, or possibly, um, and and stay in the conservatory, the green bedroom. Then that's that's you. I have never slept in there. Oh wow! But, you know there are some greater than I. <laughs> that's very cool. We'll we'll find out, Kyle, if you are or not. Okay, that's. I I really am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. This is an excellent, uh, another excellent episode with Inspired Ghost Tracking and Win. It's so nice to meet you on this. Thank you for your time. I want I want to go, go round robin. Rob, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us back and uh, and letting us share the uh, the investigation. I hope everybody gets a chance to to visit Linville Manor. And Rob, do you want to promote a book or anything? Is there or, or are you going to write a book on this? This will probably be in my uh, Ghost on a Medium Vacation book for a couple of years from now. But Pets in the Afterlife 4 about cat messages is coming out in 2023. Oh, that's awesome. Look forward to it. And Troy, uh, I know you don't do books, but what's up with you? Thank you for being here. And is there anything that you want to uh, talk about? Any upcoming events? Uh, no, actually, uh, sometimes Rob invites me out to once in a while to an event where he is. And I love love to do that from time to time. But I can tell you, Kyle, if when you decide you want to stay there, if you're up for it, let me know. <laughs> I'd be happy to come out. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Absolutely. Excellent. And Wynn, thank you for sharing your residence and your story with us. We really appreciate it. This is something that I'm sure other people, once they hear this podcast, will want to hear more about as well. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's It's been an absolute pleasure. And Rob and Troy, I just I can't thank you guys enough for what you've done here and bringing me into your communities. It's It's great to be a part of this family. So thank you so much. been listening to the afraid of nothing podcast please subscribe and like us on facebook until next time stay scared hey you're still here great then why not listen to another episode visit afraid of nothing podcast.com to peruse all the shows that's afraid of nothing podcast.com and while you're there Click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.